we'll go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, I'm Joni Carswell. I'm the CEO and president at Texan by Nature. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Texan by Nature, we are a 501c3 conservation nonprofit. We were founded in 2011 by former First Lady Laura Bush. At the broadest stroke, our mission is to advance conservation. We believe that our long-term prosperity and health are dependent upon our natural resources. And so we advance conservation by increasing activity and increasing funding in conservation projects and organizations across the state of Texas. We do this by lifting up and connecting organizations and we bring those organizations together with industry and together with community for broader collaborative projects across the state of Texas. We partner with over 100 conservation nonprofits, leaders across every industry, local landowners and communities alike. We bring all of these groups together to focus on science-based conservation that are beneficial to our people, our prosperity and our natural resources. And I know if you're logging in today, we're speaking the same language, so we're excited to, to bring you into uh, this discussion. The style of partnership that I mentioned as Texan by Nature is actually what brings us here today. Back in 2018, North Texas Municipal Water District, Tarrant Regional Water District, and John Munker Sands Wetland Center partnered and applied for our Conservation Wrangler Program, which is an annual accelerator. We enjoyed working and learning from these organizations so much that our, our paths have continued to cross over the last few years. And earlier this summer, North Texas Municipal Water District came to us with a wonderful idea to do a, a water-focused virtual, virtual webinar series. So we were delighted by the opportunity and excited to kick that series off today. But just to zoom back out and give a little bit more background and set the stage about what we're going to talk about today. You know, as many of you know, and many of you celebrate on an ongoing basis, Texas is a unique place. And more than just being a unique and independent place, it's a unique place to demonstrate conservation, innovation, and leadership. We're big. We have 29 million people. We have four of the 10 largest cities in the US and a land mass that is twice the size of Japan. We're geographically diverse. We have 11 eco regions and 14 soil regions. We have a little bit of everything, whether you like mountains, desert, plains, forest, ocean, rivers, lakes, we, we've got a little bit of everything in the state of Texas. We also have over 150 conservation organizations operating in Texas to care for this abundance of resources. Our economy is thriving. We have a $1.9 trillion GDP, which just happens to be the ninth largest economy in the world. We're a leader in oil and gas, solar, wind, technology, agriculture, and we've led the nation in export revenue since 2002. So for almost 20 years. All of this is to say we have a lot going on in Texas and a lot that uses water to thrive. So without water, none of those statistics would be true for Texas and for us as leaders. And it's interesting because more and more industry leaders, more and more just U.S. citizens and, and, and citizens from abroad are seeing the uniqueness and the opportunity in Texas. Reports vary, but we're seeing 600 to 1,000 people move to Texas each and every day. With this mass migration, Texas's population will almost double by 2050. The latest state demographer report says that we'll have 54 million Texans by 2050. So that's a lot. It's a lot to plan for. It's a lot to ensure water for. And it has far reaching implications for our infrastructure, for our, our conservation efforts, for everything that we're involved in. You know, some of you may have heard that water is the next oil. And this is, I think, has been thrown around for a little while. I don't want to get into the debate on the veracity or the use case of that statement, but the sentiment I agree with water is vitally important and it's critical to our health and to our future. And last December, I was listening to a podcast that put it in very stark terms. 
Uh, Melissa Alderson, she's the Conservation Education Manager at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and she gave a, a podcast and she said, of all the water found on earth, 97% of it is salt water. If you're doing the math, that means that just 3% of all water is fresh water, but 80% of that water is frozen in the polar ice caps and unavailable for our use. So what we're left with is one half of 1% for our own use. We share that tiny amount of fresh water with nearly 8 billion human beings and nearly 9 million animal species. How many individual creatures? We don't know, we're still discovering. So that's to say fresh water is critical and fresh water becomes even more critical as our population continues to expand. Bringing this back to Texas and our own population growth, you see that fresh water and how we manage it in Texas is more important every single day. So I've said I'm excited already, but I, I'm truly thrilled for you to have the opportunity to listen to three experts today and to learn more about how we ensure a thriving future for all Texas at uh, Texans and how we ensure a thriving future for our economy moving forward. We're gonna look at the overall water outlook and water plan for the state of Texas. We're gonna look at how we treat our water and ways that we can conserve our water today so that we are the best at utilizing our most vital resource and we can add more statistics to the data points that I shared at the beginning. So the three folks that we're gonna hear from today, we're gonna to kick it off with Sarah Schlesinger. She's the Chief Executive Officer at the Texas Water Foundation. She's gonna paint the broad picture of where we are on water today, our water plan, and what that looks like. She's gonna hand it off to Helen Dulac, the Water Resource Program and Public Education Manager from the North Texas Municipal Water District. He's gonna teach us a little bit more about water treatment and, and what that looks like in the state of Texas. And we're gonna end with Dr. Dr. Becky Bowling with Texas A&M AgriLife who will share best practices and water conservation tips for all of us. So again, as you have questions, put them in the Q&A, but I am thrilled to learn from these three fantastic women today, and we will get started and kick it off with Sarah from the Texas Water Foundation. Sarah? Joni, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I um, believe that I can share my presentation with you today. You set that up perfectly in talking about all of the ways in which we are fortunate to live in such an incredibly rich and diverse state. As Joni mentioned, I'm Sarah Schlesinger. I'm the CEO of Texas Water Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit in Texas with the mission of leading Texas into a sustainable future by investing in the next generation of water leaders. And we do that in three ways. We do that by investing in leadership, both within the water sector and, without, and, and outside of the water sector, and advancing nonpartisan informed non-technical policy. So if you're interested in reading some issue briefs on, on topics um, uh, right now at the state legislature, at the federal level, you're welcome to go to our website. And by advancing our general awareness of the value and role that water plays in every Texan's life. And we're doing that by launching the first statewide water education campaign called Texas Runs on Water. I've been invited though, as Joni mentioned, to paint the broad picture about what our forecast in, in Texas looks like in terms of water security, in terms of our water future. And as Joni so, so poignantly put it, we have a significant population increase projected for the state of Texas, more than 70% between 2020 and 2070. Well, in water planning, there's something called a water budget. And much like balancing your pocketbooks, it has a little bit to do with looking at how much demand there is and how much supply there is in balancing the two. Well, what we know is with this population increase going from 29 and a half million to 51 million, our water demands are going to go up, of course, and our existing water supplies are going to decrease. They're going to decrease because of things like climate variability and, of course, because a lot of our water usage comes from groundwater supplies, which are non-renewable. And so what that means is whether you're a water scientist or not, Houston, we have a problem. We got a water budget issue. Fortunately, however, Texas is uh, blessed with very strong water leadership and a state water plan. 
Every five years, we adopt a state water plan that assesses that demand and supply curve and, popu and, and, and pr population projections. And we determine which water management strategies we need to implement in order to meet that demand. And what's really unique about the state water plan is that it's done in a decentralized way. It's done from local stakeholders up. So combining the different regional water plans and combining it into a state water plan. So our most recently adopted state water plan, and it was really recently adopted, proposes 5,800 water management strategies to provide 7.7 .7 million acre feet of water by 2070. Well, what is exactly 7.7 .7 million acre feet of water? Um, it's always hard for me to kind of imagine what that is when we talk about acre feet. So this is a helpful drawing. Imagine a football field and then imagine water coming up about a foot, so about to your knee, and then imagine that 7.7 .7 million times. So a single acre foot of water is 325,000 gallons of water. Um, it's a lot of water. It's a lot of strategies too. So what I want to tell you about is really quickly in five minutes, how exactly we're going to plan for the water future and why it is that water conservation is so important within that. So what we know is of those 5,800 water strategies that are proposed to meet our water demands in the next 50 years, it's going to cost about $80 billion um, to design, construct, and implement by 2070. We also know that unfortunately that if we don't implement those strategies, that it will cost Texas about $153 billion of annual economic losses. So there's definitely a case study to be made from a pure economic perspective. And we also know that if we don't implement those strategies, that a fourth of Texas population will have less than half of the municipal water supplies required. Well, you're going to ask why municipal water supply specifically, and you'll see here in a second why in terms of demand. Fortunately, Texas is also very wise in its leadership, in addition to having a state water plan to implement or to create a revolving fund, so a way specifically to fund water infrastructure. So we have a revolving fund, and so far over $9 billion has been committed to state water plan projects. We still have $80 billion to go. So here's what we know. As Joni said, we've got this huge increase in population increase because of all of the wonderful things that Texas has to offer. And what I wanted to show was how different this really is from um, a historic perspective. So how much more demand there's going to be in terms of what we've ever had to deal with in the past. And what we also know is that while that demand curve is not going up quite so steeply that our existing supply is also going to continue to decrease. So the, the, the distance between the two is gonna to continue to, to increase. And within the demand, we'll see that there are some main categories. Irrigation from 2020 to 2070 stays largely the same and so do those top portions. But the piece that really changes is that big red portion on the screen. And that one is municipal. Municipal uh, demand makes up most of the increase that we are seeing in water demand. And that's because a lot of the people who are moving to Texas are moving to some of the wonderful urban centers that we have. So of the recommended water management strategies that we have in our state water plan, we see that a lot of it's gonna come from reuse and desal and conservation. But the two that I really want to draw your attention to are the second and third where that light green is agricultural conservation. Um, Texas agriculture makes up a, a big portion of our groundwater usage and also is, has been um, very progressive adopters of conservation and efficiency metrics. But municipal conservation makes up a huge amount of the demand management that's going to be required to meet our future water demands. And very specifically within our state water plan, we know that 45% of Texas's future water is going to come from conservation and reuse today. So I want you to take a moment to really think about backtrack all those numbers that I gave you 7.7 .7 million acre feet of water. 45% of that comes from conservation and reuse today and the biggest demand is in municipal areas. So this is where you come in and this is where I'm going to hand it off as well. What I really hope you take away from, from this short introduction to Texas's water security and water forecast is that municipal conservation makes up one of our largest water security targets and that efficiency is just as important as reducing demand. And what I mean by that is investing in water infrastructure, uh, investing in, in uh, water efficient um, appliances in your household can be a, a huge benefit. And you'll hear from some of your local leaders on exactly what you can do in your region. 
And so as Joni said, whether you care about Texas's thriving population and economy or rich and wild landscape, water is the lifeblood of Texas and we appreciate you having an interest in it. I'm happy to take any questions and otherwise, thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, and I am now handing it off to Helen Dulac with the North Texas Municipal Water District. Thank you, Sarah. Water rights and water planning are so important and so fascinating. So how is that looking for everybody? My screen? Looks good on my end, Helen. Thank you. All right, Kim, um, I'd like to uh, ask the audience a question. So if you don't mind, please indicate where do you get your water from? Do you get it from a lake, a well, groundwater or aquifer? other, or are you not sure? So I'll share where the North Texas Municipal Water District gets our water from after a brief history. So it all started back in the 1940s. The cities listed here relied on groundwater. Even though the population was only 32,000, community leaders knew they needed a reliable source of water. They realized it would be difficult and expensive for each of them to provide water on their own. So they joined together and asked the state of Texas for help. The state of Texas created the North Texas Municipal Water District through legislation in 1951, which just so happens to be the time the US Army Corps of Engineers was constructing Levon Lake. We've provided water to the original member cities since 1956. Our basic mission is to meet the various needs of our member and direct customer cities. At the request of our member cities, we added wastewater services in the 70s and solid waste services in the 80s. Besides the 13 member cities, we also have 34 direct customers comprised of special utility districts and other cities. All of these 80 communities use our regional systems and share the expense of operations and maintenance of water services. Currently, almost 2 million people rely on the treated water we provide. Our service area is about 2,200 square miles, which is about twice the size of Rhode Island. And inside of that area are some of the fastest growing cities in the nation. Getting clean, safe water to millions of people is not easy and we take it very seriously. In order to do this, we have 18 water pump stations, six water treatment plants that can treat up to 876 million gallons of water a day and over 600 miles of transmission pipes to get the water to our member and customer cities. On the wastewater side, we service 24 communities and 1.3 million people. We have 230 miles of sewer pipes that bring the wastewater to our 13 wastewater treatment plants. We have the capacity to treat up to 163 million gallons before releasing that cleaned water into our waterways. On the solid waste side, we service five member cities with three transfer stations that transport waste to our landfill in Melissa, Texas. All landfills emit methane gas and we capture the methane and sell it to help offset our operation costs. So let's check the results of the poll. Where do most people get their water from? And if most people said, a lake in which 75% of people do. Well, guess what? That's where we get our water from too. So currently the district draws water from Lavon Lake, Lake Texoma, Lake Tawakoni, Chapman Lake, and the East Fork Water Reuse Project, which people can visit at John Bunker Sands Wetland Center. The district can store and use water from any of these sources, but the lakes are managed and operated by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Therefore, the Corps can release water in any amount and at any time from these lakes. However, Bodark Lake will be the first reservoir the district fully owns and operates. So here's an overview of our water treatment process that we will go into in detail. We get our water from reservoirs like Levon, we clean and treat it and send it to the cities and special utility districts who then send it to, out to their customers. Our six water treatment plants use a multi-step process to treat and disinfect the water. 
the backbone processes are coagulation and sedimentation. The water is filtered and then goes through a two-step disinfection process. The first is ozonation, and then chlorine is added as a second disinfectant to maintain water quality as that water travels long distances to storage tanks, then to pipes, then to homes and businesses. So I wanna welcome you to the Wiley Water Treatment Plant. This is our largest plant that sits on over 450 acres and is where I work. It's located on the shores of Lavon Lake in Wiley, Texas. I'm gonna take you on a very special tour of our water treatment plant and give you a very detailed explanation of the process. Water treatment starts with bringing the water in. This water is called raw water. The Wiley plant raw water sources are Lavon Lake and Lake Texoma. Raw water is the natural water from lakes and rivers. It has impurities in it like dirt and algae. The raw water pump stations that you see on the left move the water into a mixing structure to blend the sources together. Chlorine dioxide is added, which helps remove naturally occurring iron and manganese. To control zebra mussels, we have a balancing reservoir 30 miles from Lake Texoma. It's basically a small lake that the water pours into and rests for a bit. Here, we can test for zebra mussels, if any of them happen to find their way in. And uh, if there are zebra mussels there, they actually can sink to the bottom of the reservoir. Most of them don't survive their turbulent 30 mile trip to, to the balancing reservoir. Plus, we have very, very fine mesh screens that keep the zebra mussels out of the pipeline. The water then continues to travel an additional 47 miles to Wiley. The next step of water treatment are coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation. A coagulant makes things clump together. Here, the coagulant is ferric sulfate. It attracts solids and bacteria together, forming flock, which looks like snowflakes in the water. The flock bumps together and creates larger and heavier flock. Then the water goes through the sedimentation process. In this step, Large tanks or basins are designed to take several hours for the water to flow through, giving time for all of that flock to settle out and fall to the bottom of the basin. In the picture on the left, you can see the, plock, the flock particles forming. Past the flock, you see everything starting to settle and the water looks a pretty blue. The flock is orange because of, a, of the coagulant is iron based. In the upper right picture, you can see an entire basin. After a couple of hours in these basins, the water flows through the weirs at the end. After most of the solids have settled, you can see the cleaner water coming over the weir. The sediment and flock are pumped to storage lagoons. Once these lagoons are full, the dried sediment is hauled off to be used as an iron rich soil enhancer for farms. The next step is disinfection. Our first round of disinfection is ozone. Ozone disinfection is highly effective. It inactivates harmful bacteria and improves the taste and odor of the water. Since ozone is not stable, it dissipates rapidly and leaves no residual and is considered the best for water treatment. We actually make ozone at Wiley because we harness the power of lightning. Okay, not quite, but in the same way that ozone is formed during lightning storms, we can generate it in a controlled environment. This process takes a high voltage electric current and passes it through oxygen gas. Some of the oxygen molecules are split apart into atoms of oxygen. The single oxygen atoms want friends, so they bond together with the oxygen molecule to form ozone. So what does making ozone look like? Well, it actually looks like a bunch of pipes and tanks. In the left side picture, you can see three white oxygen storage tanks storing cryogenic oxygen. That flows into three tall stainless steel vaporizers, and this is where the liquid oxygen expands into oxygen gas. The next picture, you can see three ozone generators. Notice how large they are compared to the people in the picture. That's where the oxygen molecules are zapped, break apart, and form ozone. Now, fun fact, the district operates the largest ozone treatment plant in Texas and one of the largest in the world. The water is then disinfected again with chlorine. Chlorine is the only secondary disinfection approved by the EPA and the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality, so we must use it. Chlorine not only disinfects the water, 
it's persistent and continues to stay in the water. This is how we can ensure the water is safe once it leaves our facility. The water now has a disinfectant in it, even at the furthest reaches of our 2,200 square mile system. However, heat and age can take a toll on chlorine. So to help it last longer, we add ammonia to bond with the chlorine to form chloramines. That now this helps provide a long lasting residual. So after coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, ozonation, and chlorination, we're at filtration. Filtration is the final step in removing suspended solids or small particles from the water. The water is pulled by gravity through filters consisting of a layer of anthracite or carbon and another layer of sand. This removes any particles from the water. So the final treated water is delivered to our member cities and direct customers to be distributed to their end users, residents and businesses. Treated water is sent through hundreds of miles of pipeline to city and direct customer storage tanks. They take over delivering the water through their distribution systems to their customers. Our staff monitors city tanks to ensure they're filled to the correct levels to meet demands. Our operations staff works hard every day around the clock to ensure reliable water delivery to all of our member cities and direct customers. This is a photo of our new control room. The control room is staffed with operators 24 seven to monitor all the processes from one centralized location across our treatment plant and even throughout the entire regional system. Operators use a special computer system to operate pumps, adjust valves, monitor pressure, and modify the treatment process. They control water coming into the plant, moving through the treatment process, and distributing that clean water to the communities we serve. To keep the water flowing, we have an electrical substation on site. Additionally, our staff works to lock in low power rates and we pump during off peak hours when possible. So after all of that work to clean and treat the water, we're still not done. We have to make sure the water is safe and meets all standards and regulations. Our laboratory is accredited by TCEQ through the National Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program and conducts nearly 250,000 tests a year to make sure the water is safe and doesn't have a bad taste or smell. We test samples for bacteria, suspended solids, metals, nutrients, alkalinity, hardness, and much more. We even test the water as it goes through the treatment process. This helps with process control and optimizing treatment. Our member cities and direct customers also treat the, uh, test the water before they distribute it to their customers. The district in each member city produces their own annual water quality or consumer confidence reports. Most of these can be accessed at each city or water utility website. The district is also constantly improving our treatment operations, expanding our facilities to meet increasing demands and adding enhanced technology and equipment. Recently, one of our major projects at the Wiley Water Treatment Plant was upgrading the capacity and filter improvements at a cost of $95 million. Now that you've seen everything it takes to get water to you, I have one more question. Can you please launch the poll? What costs more, a gallon of water from the North Texas Municipal Water District or a gallon of water from the store? So go ahead and vote there and think what, uh, indicate what you think costs more. All right, and let's see what, what does everyone think? Look at that, 98% of people are correct. A gallon of water from the store costs more. The district sells water to our member cities for about a penny a gallon. So I invite you to visit our website, ntmwd.com, and follow us on all the social platforms. 
Our website is full of information where you can find water quality and lab reports, lake levels, fact sheets, infographics, along with water conservation tips and initiatives. Speaking of water conservation, it is my pleasure to welcome Becky Bolin with Texas A&M AgriLife, who will share the best water conservation practices and actions we can take to ensure we have this reliable resource now and in the future. Thank you so much, Helen. Let me get this loaded here. Perfect. So there's so many things that we can talk about as it relates to water conservation. I mean, certainly we could fill more than 10 minutes of time uh, with this topic, um, but I've tried to find just a few things that are simple and easy to implement for you guys to take with you today, whether you're thinking about it for your home, your business, or your landscape. So the first thing that I wanted to emphasize is that conservation really comes down to the idea of being mindful and as efficient as possible in the way that we use water. So there's so many different ways that we can do this, but just starting to create awareness every time we're using water, every time we're disposing of waste, which will tie back to water quality here in a little bit as well. How can we be as conscientious as possible and as efficient as possible with the resources that we're using and handling? Next slide, please. So um, I thought this was a nice visual. I actually got this uh, from a nice uh, pamphlet that the Texas Water Development Board has. And so um, it's got some nice data there comparing uh, conserving homes with non-conserving homes as it relates to water use. And this is actually about 20 years old. So we might expect that these numbers look even greater today as we've seen improvements in, in technology that's available. Um, but one of the figures or one of the, the uh, pieces of data that kind of came out of this uh, handbook of water use and conservation um, that the Water Development Board featured is um, on average water use in a conserving home is about 45.2 gallons per capita per day and in a non-conserving home it's about 69.3 gallons per capita per day. Um, so certainly we appreciate the importance of conserving water of course from an environmental standpoint we've already touched on a lot of great things today with some of these other talks as to why that's important um, but another thing that may be important to some of you is the idea of conserving money as well um, and over the long term what it can mean to conserve water on a day-to-day -day basis and what this means for our water bill. Next slide please. So there's a lot of different places in which we can conserve water. I, I decided to focus um, first on, on the indoor space and then we'll move into the outdoor space. And so three really simple things that we can do to conserve water indoors. Um, the first is to routinely check faucets and other plumbing for leaks and where you do observe leaks, uh, making sure that you're staying on top of repairs um, to prevent unnecessary water loss or wasted water. The next, which was also mentioned in a previous talk is uh, where you can bringing in water efficient technology. And this is where it can be great to actually look for the EPA water sense label on products, whether it's a, a low flow toilet or something similar. A lot of new great pieces of technology out there that can help you use water more efficiently in your home. And in many cases, we may see that uh, your local government, local, local cities, um, local water providers may actually reward you for bringing in some of this new technology and helping to conserve water. So uh, that can be something that you look for in your local community. And then finally, it's just something very simple which is turning water off when we're not using it. Um, so a great example of this is when we brush our teeth. If we leave water running during that period that we're brushing our, our teeth, the EPA estimates that we may be wasting as much as five, uh, as much as four gallons of water um, each time. And so for brushing our teeth uh, twice a day, that's eight gallons a day. And if we extrapolate that across seven and a half million people just here in the Metroplex, well, that's a lot of gallons of water um, that are being wasted when we're brushing our teeth. So doing something really Really simple like that. Um, other really basic tips may include scraping your dishes instead of relying heavily on water to rinse them clean before you put them in the dishwasher. It's so really basic things. Next slide, please. A really great space for us to uh, conserve water is going to be outdoors as well, and this is where a lot of my passion lies. So um, you may or may not know that uh, throughout the course of the year, 30 to 60 percent of household water uh, is used for lawn and landscape areas. And certainly we see that we tend to be on the higher end of this when we're getting into this hottest part of summer. And um, this year we've been fortunate to have some rainfall, but um, oftentimes this time of year we may not see any rainfall for several weeks. And so we tend to water very heavily during this period. Now, interestingly enough, um, 
uh, if we advance here, what we'll see is that as much as 50% of the water that we're using in the landscape may not actually ever be taken up or used by plants. We may see a, a loss of evaporative losses, or, or we also see uh, quite a few issues with runoff here um, due to impervious surfaces, as well as heavy slopes in the landscape, um, very fine textured soils. Many of you may be familiar with some of our shrinking, swelling, heavy clays that we have in many parts of the state of Texas, which are not always conducive. Um, to uh, allowing water to penetrate in. And so we'll end up seeing a lot of runoff and loss of that water in our landscape areas. Next slide, please. So uh, several different things that we can do um, when we're trying to conserve water outdoors. One very simple thing is to really take time to get your, to know your irrigation system. So whether you have just moved into a brand new property or you've purchased an older home, um, where that irrigation system exists, taking time to do a catch can test to become familiar with the precipitation rate for that system. So oftentimes many of our more conservative irrigation approaches are based on evapotranspiration rates or water loss from plants and surrounding surfaces due to environmental characteristics like heat or wind or humidity. Um, as in place that water, um, what we need to do is know how many inches per water our irrigation system puts out over a set amount of time so that we can be really precise in our approach. We also may see that irrigation systems may not be designed very efficiently, um, or maybe that design is no longer effective as our landscape has evolved or matured over time. Or there may even be things, simple things like clogged nozzles or heads that are not rotating properly that we need to adjust. Another thing that we can really focus on as it relates to watering our landscape is doing everything we can to slow water down. So with our lawn irrigation, one thing that we may look at is replacing uh, spray nozzles with uh, multi-stream rotor nozzles, something that's going to put out water at a, heavy, a heavier water that's going to come into contact with the lawn and with the soil uh, more readily and is gonna be less susceptible to wind or evaporative losses. In our landscape beds, and even we do see more and more drip irrigation utilization in lawn scenarios. So certainly drip emitters and, um, and uh, soaker hoses are going to offer us around 90% efficiency in a lawn and landscape scenario. So it's really going to allow us to be as efficient and as effective as possible um, in getting water directly to our plants. Next slide, please. Another thing that we really, really want to focus on, and I think that we're seeing more and more in North Texas that this is becoming something that people are more aware of, is the idea of getting the right plants in the right place. And so uh, making sure that we're choosing materials that are the right fit for the soil that we have, for the amount of water that we have available, um, for the amount of shade that we have, and for the space that we have. And as much as possible, relying on native and adapted plant materials that are well suited for this area and are by default not going to require as many inputs, whether that be water inputs or also things like fertilizers or pesticides um, that may actually then in turn cause issues with our water quality. Um, so adding those native and adaptive plants, choosing right plants and putting them in the right place um, goes a long way toward having more water efficient landscapes. Another thing that we uh, can really focus on, whether you are an outreach educator, which I know we have several on here, or whether you're a homeowner, is really trying to take stock of where you may be overloving your lawn and landscape. And so what we tend to see a lot of times is that people are trying to do right by their lawn. They're out there watering um, almost every day. And what we end up doing when we do this is we actually create kind of codependent plant babies, codependent plant materials um, that never learn to develop those roots deeper in the soil. So we really want to focus on deep and infrequent irrigation, encouraging deeper root growth. And we want to stay away also from over-fertilizing, over-utilizing pesticides that may actually have an adverse effect on the health of our plants. So we want to take time to find the right balance, getting a soil test done, customizing our nutrient management approach. Um, all of these things can be really helpful toward creating a lawn and landscape that's more resilient in the long term. Next slide, please. And then another thing that we can really do is where we can take advantage of rainwater, whether you're capturing rainwater off of your roof or other surfaces in the landscape in a rain barrel to use in different ways, or maybe you're thinking about bringing in some green infrastructure. So thinking about how water moves across your landscape and incorporating in plant materials and different soil materials that are gonna help you really capture and utilize that water as it's coming onto your landscape. And the other advantage that we see to this a lot of times is that 
many plant materials actually have the ability to do what we call phytoremediation. So it's the idea that they have the ability to help clean water as it moves through the landscape with their roots. And we also see that soils can help to clean water as well. So we wanna encourage that water move into the soil around our plant roots as it's moving through our landscape and that we can capture and retain as much of that as possible. Next slide, please. So I did want to touch just briefly on this concept of water quality um, and this idea that everything we do is connected and a lot of the best management practices that we may uh, bring in to conserve water can also offer benefits for protecting water quality as well in the long term. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of different places where we may see water quality as being affected by some of our decisions. So um, we may see a lot of impact from the way that we dispose of waste. Certainly uh, plastics and garbage can become an issue. Uh, we see issues with bacterial movement and accumulation of bacteria in our surface water a lot of times. And this can come from things um, like even just pet and animal poop in our yard that's running off into our surface water areas, as well as uh, mishandling or you know, on-site sewage. Uh, dumping inappropriate waste handling and things like that. We also see issues with people dumping things down their drain that shouldn't be dumped on the drain. So pesticides, uh, pharmaceuticals, other chemicals, things that are being flushed down the toilet that shouldn't be flushed down the toilet and start to accumulate in our water resources over time. And then another thing that people often don't think about is that you can actually cause uh, water pollution in the way that you handle nutrients in your landscape. And so this means that some of the fertilizers that we use and the way that we apply them can have really significant implications for our water resources where some of the nitrogen and phosphorus in particular, as it moves into our surface water can actually feed things like algae and cyanobacteria. And these things can grow and start to consume oxygen in the water as a function of that concentration of, uh, of nutrients. And then what we end up seeing is dead zones that are created because those nutrients have become really heavily concentrated. We see an issue with this more and more in urban environments where nutrients are moving into surface water, into groundwater from urban landscapes as a function of how we fertilize, how we irrigate. So again, getting back to this idea of not over uh, loving, customizing your approach and trying to be really mindful of this. Next slide, please. So a lot of really basic things that we can do. Um, we can start by just recycling and reusing where we can to reduce the risk of waste accumulating in our water resources. And this extends to the idea of composting as well, which is becoming increasingly popular um, as a way of kind of containing and reusing food waste, repurposing it in our landscape. And a lot of times when we have a nice high quality compost material, we can also reduce the need for synthetic fertilizers in our landscapes. Uh, taking time to scoop the poop, uh, whether it's in your own yard or if you take your pet out, you know, I live in over in the Plano area right off of the Chisholm Trail. Um, and this is something that really gets emphasized there to keep um, water from moving feces, nutrients from that, from uh, bacteria, from that poop into um, the water there. We also want to, if we do have pesticides, prescription materials, we want to look for where we can properly dispose of those materials. So if you have pesticide materials, oftentimes the TDA or similar entities will provide an option for you to dispose of those materials safely. Um, there's several places a lot of times too where we can uh, dispose of our prescription uh, medications. Uh, we want to be, again, mindful of the use of fertilizer materials, recognizing that these actually can contribute to water pollution in urban landscapes. So using them um, as uh, we want to be as judicious as possible, as mindful as possible. Take time to sweep your fertilizer granules off the sidewalk and off of those impervious surfacer, surfaces where they can be picked up and run off. And also doing what we can to reduce runoff from our landscape as well. So this may be simple practices like cycle and soak irrigation to gradually introduce water into the landscape at a, at a lower rate, um, giving our landscape time to absorb that water, making sure that we time our irrigation appropriately, um, that we take steps to encourage deep, healthy root growth, which is also going to help get water deeper in the soil and prevent runoff. So a lot of things that we can do there too. Next slide, please. And finally, just never stop learning. So there's, I, you know, I can tell just looking at the list of, of people that are watching and joining here today, there's a lot of people on this uh, particular meeting that 
offer different forms of education on these topics uh, all throughout the Metroplex and in other parts of the state. And so taking time to look at where you can learn more about this from your local government, from local educators. And there's a lot of people that are really passionate about this and a lot of opportunities to always get better with the way that we handle our water resources. So from here, I'm going to hand it back over to Joni. I think she's going to uh, moderate some Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Becky. And thank you, Sarah, Helen, and Becky. If you guys could all join me on video again, thanks for sharing your expertise. Um, everything from looking at the broad outlook of water uh, and, and what our, our state plan entails to the individual actions that we can each take are incredibly important. So I want to kick off the questions actually with you, Sarah, and get your take on the importance of individual action versus large-scale infrastructure and in that you shared, you know, that 45% number around the municipal need uh, with water and, and then the biggest water user being agriculture and some of our industry. So if you could share just a little bit on importance of individual versus large-scale infrastructure and then the policy changes that are needed for a more sustainable future for Texas. Gosh, thank you. What a, what a phenomenally important question. Um, what is unique about Texas, and I mentioned this in our state water plan, but this is true about our water management at large, is that we operate at a decentralized level. So everything that's happening at a statewide policy is being implemented, is being discussed, um, at the local level. So that individual participation, not just in your water usage and your selection of water efficiency is important, but also your participation in your decision about the regional water planning process and your participation at the local utility level in your participation at your local groundwater conservation district. So every decision that's being made at the statewide level is being informed by local participation. Um, so that is a, my kind of first general statement that I would make there. But in terms of some of the larger uh, changes that we need to see. I would say the largest one is that water policy in Texas tends to be informed by the fact that Texas is in um, cyclical drought punctuated by disastrous flood. And what that means is that whenever we have a landmark piece of legislation pass, uh, it is usually informed by the fact that we have just come out of a significant uh, disaster or challenge. And water infrastructure and its needs are, are, are not... Uh, are not just disaster driven, they require resilience, they require ongoing uh, investment. And there is an ongoing discussion right now at the state level and at the federal level regarding water infrastructure investment needs that I think really needs to have um, heightened prominence. So at a local level, if you care about water infrastructure and you simply want to nudge your local uh, elected leaders to encourage them to be thinking about water as an important water agenda, that's another great way to have an impact. Thanks so much, Sarah. The next question is for Helen. Um, who do you retain or what types of firms do you generally use to monitor and sample the water other than analytical labs? Can you talk a little bit more about that process? Um, who's providing the data that, that you're sharing? So the, the, the TCEQ and EPA uh, require that the samples be um, analyzed by laboratories that meet specific accreditation. So they, so that's why we have our own lab uh, uh, get that accreditation. And the, we have our own staff that collects the samples throughout our distribution system. But then each city uh, member or direct customer that we sell water to, they are, once the water goes into their storage tank, they are responsible for it. So they have their own distribution system, their own pipes in their own city limits, and they have they can contract or usually they have their own staff that will take samples of that water and either take it, they can contract a private lab, they could bring it to our lab uh, to get those tests analyzed also. So as long as you're using an accredited laboratory, you can choose anyone you wanna use, but because of the volume of tests that we do, 250,000 a year, it made sense for us to accreditate our own laboratory. Helen, so the, the next question is at that individual level, um, and I, I, actually let me backtrack that. 
um, probably asked in the spirit of individual level, but definitely applicable to much larger scale uh, as well. But this one is for, for Becky. Um, are there any resources or information available on completely replacing lawns? And along with that, if, if you don't have a sprinkler system today, what type of sprinkler system or what type of technologies and tools should you look out? And Becky, if you could talk a little bit about the resources available, the individual home level, and you know, to you on, on corporate campuses as well. Yeah, sure. So um, I know that there are a number of resources that are focused um, in particular on site preparation and plant selection. One thing that we really want to focus on is finding resources that are customized to your specific area. So recognizing that even across Texas, even across the Metroplex, we'll see some diversity in terms of our precipitation rate, the type of soil that we have. All of these things have an impact on what's appropriate, both in terms of removing what's there and preparing and designing something new. So for example, um, you know, some people really like the idea of a, a bare minimum zero escape or something like that. And what we want to recognize is that it's in areas where we have more precipitation, we want to make sure that we make, maintain enough vegetation um, to cover and protect our soil in, air, in those particular areas. If we do too much soil exposed or, or things like that, then we end up having some negative consequences. So I would say that Texas a and AgriLife offers a number of different resources. You can certainly contact me and I'm happy to help put, put some of those together for you. They're, um, they're in a, a several different places. And so we do have the AgriLife bookstore. It's being renovated right now. Um, and so we have resources across our Aggie Turf program, um, as well as our Aggie Horticulture program that would be helpful for somebody looking to do something new and something different. Um, other places that are, are great for getting um, tips on alternative plant materials um, would be the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, for example. They have a really nice database of native plant materials, and you can filter that out um, by different regions and some of your uh, some of your other characteristics of your area, lighting and size and things like that. So they're a great resource as well. So a lot of resources, um, even going maybe to your county office and seeing if they have more for your specific county. And um, when it comes to bringing a new irrigation, I think that um, it's going to vary a little bit from landscape to landscape. Um, so, you know, when we're thinking about um, whether it's a total lawn renovation or just an irrigation renovation, we want to think, um, you know, do I have the right turf grass in place? Because that's going to play a big role in terms of how sustainable that lawn is going to be and what's appropriate from an irrigation standpoint. Um, as I mentioned, we do see increasingly there's some popularity with having uh, um, a, a kind of drip irrigation in lawns where they actually have those drip lines just below the lawn installed. Um, if you decide to go the route of having a, a subsurface irrigation with traditional sprinklers, then like I mentioned, we want to focus on um, having sprinkler heads or nozzles that are going to put out water as efficiently as possible, so multi-stream rotors. And we do have several licensed irrigators and irrigation specialists that work here with Texas a and AgriLife, so again, that's something I'm happy to connect you with for more specific questions. Thank you, Becky. And remember, for those of you who weren't taking notes, a recording will be available to re-listen to those resources after, after the session is over. Um, I do have a lot of questions coming in around aquifer storage in the DFW area, the proposed um, reservoir, uh, the Martin Nichols Reservoir. And so I, I want to ask a more general question around that to um, all three of you, but I think pro probably primarily to Helen and, and Sarah around your thoughts on aquifer and reservoir usage in that DFW area. Um, would one of you would like to offer your thoughts on that? Well, I can say that unfortunately I am not a geologist, so I am not 100% sure if our underground, you know, structures are able to function as a reservoir. I do know we have a few natural springs in the area, but what from from what I understand they're not that large and I don't know if they can provide the volume that we need for the population growth that we're you know, we're experiencing or will experience. And um, the other thing about reservoirs is they also offer a place for recreation. So they have a dual function as for water storage, water supply, recreation, and they also supply wildlife habitat. Um, and another option we have is water reuse. So the, you mentioned, Joni, earlier about the um, John Bunker Sands Wetland Center. So that is a source of water for the North Texas Municipal Water District. We built an 1800 acre wetland that we pull water from the Trinity 
run it through the wetland in a week or two, pump that into Lake Levon to supplement our volumes in Lake Levon when Lake Levon gets low. So um, that is not necessarily new technology. You know, it's the original technology for water treatment, but that is something that the district understands is important that we support. And we also built an additional pump that brings even more water to the res into, I'm sorry, more water to the wetland so that we can utilize that resource uh, and that technology. Joni, I was going to jump in and say that I'm, I'm going to uh, allude to the financial, the pocketbook analogy that I used uh, when explaining a, a, a water budget and say that uh, similar to our financial portfolios, the recommendation is to have a diversified water portfolio. The key to resilience is not just relying on one, but on multiple strategies. So whether it's aquifer storage and recovery, which as Helen said, is very specific to the geology and whether or not the aquifer can, can act in that way. There are a number of wonderful studies Texas Water Development Board has done um, looking at that specifically, but resilience and, and, and diversity of strategies is really the key. Thanks so much. We are at the top of the hour. If, if there are folks who will stay on for a minute and a half, uh, I, I'd like to just do a, a quick lightning round of, of 30 seconds. You guys have, have given us everything from the 100,000 foot to the, the one foot view of, of water today. What is the one thing that you want someone to take away and remember and do? And Helen, we're gonna start with you. Sorry to put you on the spot. That's all right. I would say to become a uh, become water informed, uh, to educate yourself about water and figure out what works best in your situation. So there are just amazing resources out there. Uh, I encourage everyone to visit Water is Awesome. We have a website, a Facebook page. There is actually a webinar tonight about the right plant in the right place. And it's gonna to touch on a lot of questions that we saw come up. Uh, we had a webinar um, a few weeks ago that was about watering your yard. And that is available on the Water is Awesome Facebook page that you can review. We have resources like watermyyard.com where you can sign up to get wa weekly watering advice so you know exactly how much water to apply because we just had rain over the weekend. Most people can turn off their sprinklers, which is like Becky said, the majority of our water use. So I just encourage everybody to learn as much as they can and to implement the best practices for themselves. Fantastic, Becky. I would say use less than you think you need. I think a lot of times we very often think we need more than we do, especially when we're talking about our landscape. And so um, experiment with using less, um, focus more on waiting for signs of visible wilt or struggle in the landscape and responding to that manually instead of trying to be so preemptive that we end up doing more harm than good. Thank you. I'm going to go with do exactly what you're doing today. Stay informed, stay involved. Um, we are really fortunate to have extraordinary water leaders and extraordinary agencies and entities in, and conservation entities working in the state of Texas. So stay involved and keep learning. Thank you. And thank you again to everyone for joining us and uh, taking part in learning more about water in Texas and what you can do to be part of the solution. Thank you to our incredible expert speakers, Sarah Schlesinger from the Texas Water Foundation, Helen Dulek from North Texas Municipal Water District, and Dr. Becky Bowling from Texas A&M AgriLife. Really appreciate the time that you took to educate us today. And thank you also for all who answered questions. I know there were a couple we didn't get to. We'll try to send a written answer to those that, that we didn't get to in the Q&A today. Um, the recording will be available, so uh, look for that shortly. And uh, excited to work together with each of you to conserve water for today so that we will continue to thrive in Texas. So thanks and have a wonderful afternoon.